Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules to be here today. Um, I'd just like to begin by saying that uh, evaluating the Children's Quarry Court was a, a terrific experience uh, in many ways, the, uh, mainly because it provided an opportunity and also demanded that there be fairly close liaison with the uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, elders and respected persons who sit on the court, as well as uh, members of the Aboriginal community more broadly. The content of this afternoon's presentation is quite an ambitious one. This was a multi, uh, this was a, an evaluation that, ha that had several aspects to it and there were a whole bunch of challenges in implementing the study as well and I'd like to both uh, certainly speak to those challenges but I won't be able to cover all of the aspects of the evaluation in their entirety. I'd just begin briefly by talking about the background of the court and some of the, the uh, exercise of jurisdiction, the sentencing powers, some issues briefly around the type of court that it is, and it's quite controversial as to how one conceptualises the children's Quarry Court, its goals or aims, the objectives, the research questions that drove the study, the methodology, and I'm going to essentially focus on... Uh, the quantitative data that came out of the study that relates to trying to measure some of the outcome objectives, time permitting to talk a little bit about the observations because there was an intensive period of observation of the court hearings. Um, there were also, in addition to that, a whole bunch of interviews with stakeholders, and I won't talk about that largely because of the time factor. And there was a fourth part of the study which proved to be undoable, and this was uh, one of the challenges uh, of the study. The um, background to children's quarry courts, uh, in, and indeed to magistrate, Indigenous magistrates' courts, is really the overrepresentation of Indigenous Australians in the juvenile and criminal justice systems. And out of the uh, Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody in 1991, which found that there were a large number of Aboriginal deaths in custody. They were not disproportionate. Um, in other words, the Aboriginal death rate in custody was not disproportionate, but the absolute number was large because a large number of Aboriginals ended up uh, being detained. Um, but out of the Royal Commission, there were a number of recommendations that arose uh, to try to overcome the uh, over-representation of Aboriginals in the juvenile and criminal uh, justice systems. And these had to do with introducing laws and procedures which would try to, wherever possible, obviate uh, Aboriginals being uh, held in, uh, detained at all, uh, having more generous bail conditions and bail hostels, for example. But one of the other things was also to bring uh, Indigenous Australians into the sentencing process. And the rationale for bringing uh, providing a much more prominent role or a role for Indigenous Australians in sentencing. There, there are a number of different reasons, but they include, for example, according to the Royal Commission, uh, to try to address the negative human experience, which is the reality behind the stats of Aboriginal overrepresentation. In other words, appearance in mainstream courts, children or magistrates, uh, had generally been a very negative experience. Consequently, the courts were not deemed to be legitimate on the part of the Indigenous community and therefore perhaps were not taken all that seriously. So another rationale was to enhance the perceived legitimacy of the court and hence the defendant's responsiveness to the decisions made by the court. Another rationale was to empower and strengthen the uh, Indigenous community uh, through enhancing the authority of elders and respected persons. And also uh, be because uh, elders and respected persons play an important role uh, as, as social control agents within uh, Indigenous communities. And as you'll see as we go along, uh, time permitting, um, and as someone just mentioned to me who'd recently sat in on a hearing of the Children's Quarry Court in Melbourne, uh, shaming is a very important part of the process of what goes on in children's uh, quarry courts, and the elders uh, often don't hold their punches uh, in, in shaming the defendants before, uh, that appear before them. And so this notion of shaming unacceptable behaviour is an important social control mechanism. There is no question that another rationale was to try to 
uh, improve the quality of relationships between the quote-unquote white community and the in indigenous community. But at the end of the day, the intent was to reduce uh, re-offending and thereby to try to deal with this whole issue of the disproportionate representation of both juveniles and adults in the uh, uh, juvenile and criminal uh, justice systems. There is an interesting background to the Koori Court, and I won't go into the detail of this, but to say that I think Victoria has been at the vanguard uh, of um, most of the states and in trying to develop appropriate responses uh, within the juvenile and adult criminal justice systems in dealing with uh, this whole issue of uh, over-representation. I sometimes think of Victoria as the Massachusetts of Australia, that it's quite progressive in all sorts of ways and, you, and we have very low, as you may be aware, we have very low and intentionally low uh, juvenile detention rates generally. Um, but the, the Children's Quarry Court came out of very close uh, Li uh, an effort in very close liaison relationships with the Aboriginal Justice Forum. Uh, there was a working group called the Statewide Reference Group that was established to develop what became known as the Children's Quarry Court Model. That resulted in legislation passed at the tail end of 2004 and the Children's Quarry Court itself began operating in October 2005, initially on a two-year pilot basis with a view to conducting an evaluation during that two-year period, but it was in fact uh, the decision was made to extend the pilot period uh, before even the first year was out and to even introduce a children's quarry court in Algeria, northwestern Victoria, uh, even before this evaluation was completed. So there's been a bit of an element of, uh, uh, of blind faith in the effectiveness of the court in terms of its capacity to uh, deal with re-offending. But the court, um, in fact, has a whole bunch of other aims and dealing with re uh, or decreasing re-offending is well, only one aspect of them. The uh, Children's Quarry Court only uh, will deal with cases for, for uh, where the defendant is of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background. The offences have to be within the jurisdiction of the criminal division of the Children's Court of Victoria. It has a family division as well that deals with child protection matters. Uh, it is a court of summary jurisdiction and, and will hear all of these type of offences listed here. Um, oh, all offences bar the ones listed here, rather. And it will also not deal with uh, sexual offences. That's also true of the Magistrates' Quarry Court for adults. The age jurisdiction in Victoria is 10 or less than 18 at the time of the alleged offence, um, although proceedings, uh, you, can, you, have, you can be over 18 but under 19 at the point the proceedings begin. The, it is only a sentencing court, in that sense it is not an adversarial court, and in order to, for the case to be heard before the Children's Quarry Court, the uh, young Aboriginal de uh, defendant either has to admit to the, to the offence has to admit, has to consent to the jurisdiction of the Children's Quarry Court, or alternatively can have gone to a mainstream Children's Court, been found guilty by that mainstream court, but, they, but opt to have the actual sentence heard before the, uh, before the Children's Court. 